Like he said, I'm Josh, I'm from Ivan. Um, to give you some context about uh, why I'm talking about this today, I'm gonna say that Ivan um, is a global multi-cloud uh, data services provider. We provide managed, uh, fully managed, uh, predictably priced uh, open source data products such as these, uh, available in multiple clouds. What that means is that these are a lot of challenges we face for testing and validating this stuff. Uh, with five multi cloud providers I can tell you about and a few others I can't, hundreds of different cloud regions. Uh, we launch 100,000 or so VMs in CI. We launch and destroy the, in CI every day. It's kind of a lot of things, that go, maybe it's not a hyperscale company, but we, we do scale quite a bit. Uh, and this presents a lot of unique challenges for CI CD uh, at you know, working at this scale. But what happens when we scale? When we talk about scale, uh, most people will think of things, oh, you know, queries per second, more traffic, more numbers, just more and more and more. But from the point of view of someone handling a lot of testing, critically, in order to get that traffic, we have to develop more use cases. We need to reach more users. And that's more things that can break, more things that we need to be testing. And in order to develop those use cases, we have to add more code. And as anybody will tell you that, that research is this kind of thing, more code means more bugs, necessarily. Uh, and we can do this so fast We can in, in our industry. In other industries, I, I, I don't know if we can kind of, we can, we can, we can, we can compare them, how much, for a car in that industry, how long do you think it takes to bring, the, um, bring a car to market from design through conception, sourcing materials down to your showroom floor? Just for comparison. Years, it takes about five to six years, probably even longer now with the chip shortages and things like that. So how many of you, if, you, if your CEO, your boss, somebody came to you and, and said, we want to, I have this idea for a, a software project, I want to go, you know, go live soon, how long do you think it'll take, me, take you to ship it? And you say five years, you'd be laughed out of the industry. Nothing takes that long in software development. We're, we're unique. This is why a lot of business types like to say, software is eating the world. We can do things that other industries can only dream of, but that also means we can run into problems so much faster than, uh, than uh, we're really capable of handling it. Uh, how many VMs can you spin up in about 15 minutes? What do you think? For me, the answer is about as many as my credit card will let me. So you, you, we, these, these aren't things that happen in other industries. And so if we take, try to take the lessons we do from other industries, they don't necessarily apply directly. We can still do QA, we still do quality control on things, but using that as a gate to ship software doesn't work. So instead, we've come up with CICD. Now what's CICD? It's Jenkins, right? No, no, it, it's, uh, <laughs> it's, CICD is, is automated systems for ensuring that we have good quality, for that we can move to the next step of whatever our pipeline of, of, of merging or deploying or whatever it is. CICD fundamentally asks some simple questions. Can I build this software? If I thought, you know, does it, can I even produce a usable artifact from it? Can I merge? You know, if I integrate this code, the, the integration part of CICD, if I integrate this code with the, what everyone else is doing, is it going to cause problems? And can I deploy? Can I ship this and is it going to break things? All of these questions are by their nature reductive questions. They, they, they remove information. This is really important uh, when you're talking about scale because most large systems, when you ask how do they operate, uh, this is an answer you get, not yes or no, but it's this. Some, you know, when you get thousands of these dashboards that tell you, you know, this is, this is working, this isn't. Every green status check mark you see on status.whatever.io, that, that's a lie. That somebody's put that there and said it, it, it most, it's mostly working. For CICD, we have to reduce information. If we don't take things down to a pass-fail, to a green build, red build scenario, then we just lay that, all that complexity of our systems at the feet of some poor sap who doesn't have any context to really evaluate it. Typically, the naive way we reduce these things is we just say and, you know, well, if this passes and this passes and this passes and this passes, then my build is green. But there are problems with doing this as you get to have more and more things. Um, 
Tests, I don't, I don't know, I, I always write, I don't know about y'all, I always write tests that, that are never flaky, but some people, some developers that we won't talk about, they write some tests that maybe don't pass all the time, even if they should. And it only takes a 0.1% failure rate uh, to get to kind of some weird situations where, it, well, at a 0.1% at a failure rate, it takes about 200 tests before you have a quarter of your, uh, of your pipelines are failing if you're using AND as your reducing function. It only takes 690, I think is what I wrote, uh, 690 uh, you know, uh, tests where you're failing half the time if you're just saying AND it all together. And this, of course, can be exacerbated by over-reliance on uh, large tests with a lot of moving parts or things that you know, have things that can fail inside of them. You can get a much high, higher failure rate than 0.1%. Um, so we have to find ways to deal with that growing aspect uh, of, you know, either by changing this reducing function to something a bit more complicated and a little more intelligent, or by uh, just running fewer tests where we don't run into this problem. And uh, on top of that, you know, running a lot of tests, you're just gonna hit a lot of problems anyways. Um, how many of you have, have a, a pipeline, you know, people say that the ideal pipeline runs in, uh, I don't know, 10 minutes, people say five minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes. How many of you have one that runs that fast? One person out of this whole room. Okay, so you start having people wait a lot longer for things. And if you try to speed it up, how many of you parallelize or run concurrently or test concurrently in order to get them to go faster? Have you ever run into problems as a result of that? Yes. Because de developers aren't sitting there writing tests thinking, oh yeah, someone else is gonna be writing another test that's, and they're all gonna be running at the same time. You have resource contention, you have problems. You hit cloud quotas. Uh, you know, yeah, you can ask to people to raise cloud quotas. Yeah, you can split accounts, but that's more overhead and more work. You hit rate limits with third-party APIs, and those aren't even uh, raisable most of the time. Uh, case in point, uh, Ivan makes huge use of uh, RAF53 from AWS. Great product, highly recommend it um, for, for DNS, and, uh, but it's not a great database, despite what some people on Twitter may say. Um, and uh, it's a great DNS product. Uh, don't, don't get mad at me. Um, the, the, um, but you, it doesn't really have a good version of select, you know, star from where, like you would in a database. Uh, so when we, we use uh, RAF53 in our CI CD, when we go to delete records that we need to delete, we have to paginate through a bunch of them, 100 at a time, to see, you know, where are the things we need to delete. Now, if you start leaving a few around, if you start growing a little bit, you're gonna start hitting a rate limit on that, and like, like we have. And then you start leaving more and more DNS records around because you, you missed a few through due to some uh, throttling. And after a while, you can't create any more DNS records because you've used all of them up and they're all junk there, and you can't even run the program to remove it. Now, we solved this particular problem by uh, waiting till off-peak hours and running the cleanup program later, but these are the kinds of problems you can run into when you just start scaling naively. On top of that, it's really expensive. If, you, uh, if you're running lots and lots of tests in CI, you literally just spend a lot of money on it. Um, you know, your, your cloud budget can get out of hand just on testing alone. Uh, but probably more importantly for most of you is you're wasting a lot of developer time. Uh, if your people are waiting, and I, well, earlier we polled people and we said, uh, you know, there's only, uh, only one out of uh, this whole room that uh, we had that 15 minute kind of target going on. That's a lot of developer time, you know, just to represent it in this room that's being wasted waiting on builds. It's very costly, not only in the, the literal time that it takes, but in the context shift that developers inevitably have to do to deal with it. They're gonna lose details when they, they ship the, you know, their context to something else. And when they come back to the problem, they're gonna know less uh, you know, about what it is. They're gonna let bugs slip through that they wouldn't slip through before. Uh, and so this unseen cost, as, as high as the cost of you know, your CI infrastructure might, might get, as high as the cost of you know, whatever services you're using to run it might get, this unseen cost is probably much higher. Now, I don't think anyone's arguing that we should just be burning money, but uh, no, no one's really saying developers can wait for their builds, you know, but it's fine. We, we know about this ideal of CI being supposed to be fast, this plat platonic ideal, this platonic solid, but our CD looks like a little scribble. So how do we solve this? How do we deal with all these problems we encounter and, and, uh, and come back to a system that makes more sense? Um, I think I wanna start with an image, a, cl a clear image of what we think CI should look like. 
and then we can go back, uh, work our way back and see what solutions get us there. The classic model to me of you know, a CI CD pipeline is a system of gates. You, uh, you, you, know, you go through your basic, and everyone's, I think everyone in this room, maybe not, every, not everybody, but most people have seen something like this. Or yeah, a developer commits, we go through the stages, you know, where they lint, build, fail fast, do a little bit more thorough test. At each point, we have a feedback loop that can go back to the developer and tell them, you need to correct something. And again, we have that idea of this takes five to 15 minutes. You know, it, it really enough time for the developer to do not, not much more than get coffee, you know? So they can keep working on the same thing. And then we have code review, which is an additional feedback loop. And, you know, although getting fast code reviews all the time is probably a talk in its own right, uh, in best case scenarios, we can get a quick code review most of the time. Uh, and then we merge, and maybe we have some later stages too, if we have a, an advanced continuous delivery system, you know, where we're going to staging, maybe a canary deployment, going to production, uh, getting further information from there. And if something happens, we can, you know, we have another feedback point. Well, that merge was bad. I can revert it. I can, uh, you know, we can fix for, we can do other things. What I think, uh, and of course, you know, and I, I don't know how many of you have a 15 to 30 minute goal, which, but that would kind of complete the hour long, you know, lead time that we, some of us might be looking for. What we miss in this, though, a lot of the times is we, we have, we, we know that, you know, okay, we had a bad merge, that was bad, we shouldn't have merged that. We forget there's another feedback loop from test to test. That when, you, when you're doing continuous delivery and your longer, more expensive test, if, 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 if they catch a bug, that's not just a failure of your code, that's a failure of your earlier tests and that you need to be able to solve. So this is really the thing that powers the ability to, to, to confidently deploy and do continuous integration at scale uh, without running all your tests all the time is that when you find problems, you fix the quick, cheap tests. Uh, why would we go to this trouble? Well, for me, it's because I want to be an elite DevOps performer. I want to be somebody that can deploy regularly within an hour, do multiple deployments per day, because that means my developers are delivering business value you know, to the customers. Um, if you're not really interested in being an elite DevOps performer, you don't have to go to this trouble, but I don't know why you're in a CI CD talk. Um, anyway, welcome if you are, but uh, that, that's, that's, that's my goal. So how do we get there? It starts with writing testable code. Uh, there's a lot of, I think, FUD around what testable code looks like and what tests should be like, and I just want to simplify this a little bit. Uh, and tell you what's worked for us and what I've seen work in the past. Um, there's a lot of notions of pragmatism around testing uh, that I think can be misguided uh, because in, in trying to be pragmatic and saying, oh, I, I, you know, real problems only happen you know, when you start having real things, you kind of miss, the, you, you end up running test code that uh, is very expensive to test. The only way that I've seen consistent results within an organization for people to write testable code is to practice test-driven development. Uh, at least some, I mean, not, maybe not at every possible moment during your development process, but at least some. Uh, and this isn't, un, this is a horrible name that should have, I, they should have come up with a different name. I, I don't know what a good name for it is, because it's not about writing tests. It's about writing, using tests to write good code. Uh, when I use test-driven development, I don't necessarily write tons and tons and tons and tons of tests. I, wrote an, I write enough tests to get the code I need done. What the benefit of what comes out of it is very testable. So if I have that problem later in production or in staging or somewhere else, I can very easily go back and add a regression case that runs with it within a few microseconds uh, and that, that catches that problem forever. And test-driven development is really, it, it's nothing more than just saying, I'm not gonna write production code until I write a test that fails and then I'll fix it. We can make it more complicated than that, but that's all it is. And this takes testing from being a second-class citizen, which it always is, unless you make it a first-class citizen intentionally, and it makes it that first-class citizen and get, makes it an important design constraint in your process. Of course, uh, you may have legacy code. Uh, legacy code is you know, code that you didn't write, I guess. Um, uh, and uh, it has this kind of property, I find, sometimes where you you want to write some tests, but uh, you need to refactor. You can't refactor your code without writing more tests. You get this icky like feedback loop you can't quite break into. Uh, there are techniques uh, to get inside of it. Uh, these are some, some uh, books that I found very effective uh, for finding ways to work uh, 
to work your you know, test into a code base that uh, is, is resistant to it. Um, particularly working effectively with legacy code, it's a bit dated, um, but the, the, the content really holds up, and I highly recommend that book uh, if, you're, if you have a code base that's littered with, with code that's hard to test. Secondly, apart from just having testable little bits, we need to have enforceable contracts between, between boundaries. Um, contracts deal with the problem of integration tests, because integration tests are slow and they're mathematically a bad idea. And what I mean by mathematically a bad idea is that it's a combinatorial explosion of integrations. The more things you integrate, the more possible uh, arrangements of code you have. It, 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 is a, you know, it is a factorial time problem. And you will try to solve this with you know, your linear developer time. It doesn't work. Um, well, what ends up happening is you write, you need to write you know, n factorial tests, and you, you'll write 10 of them. And you'll say it's good, and, uh, and you'll move on. Uh, and the, uh, contracts kind of solve this by, by, by being essentially a heuristic that reduces that, that factorial time problem down to, a, down to something much more closer to polynomial time. You write tests on the contract, if, and, you, and you write, you write uh, and you assert that they work for those components, and it, um, and you say it, uh, and you can say it mostly works, and you hope it works until they put them together. Uh, examples of contracts, so what I mean by contracts in code are things like function signatures. They can be as simple as that. They can be interfaces in languages that have that, or protocols in languages that have that kind of notion of a structural subtype. Uh, if you're doing microservices, they can be a form or other kinds of, uh, other kinds of uh, distributed uh, Computing, you can have formal specifications like open API, uh, et cetera, or whatever else. These alone are great, um, but in addition, you will also just need documentation and further agreements about code because nothing can be fully contained in a specification. Uh, these are agreements about what something needs, what it does, how it fails. Anything that contains this information can function as a contract. And if you can write tests on this, then you can just, you don't have to integrate everything in order to just ship it all the time. Of course, not everything you have is something you write. Uh, at Ivan, we, uh, we ship uh, you know, services we don't write. We have people on our open source teams that, uh, that you know, work for those, those products, but you know, we have, for example, we have people on OpenSearch along with AWS, or we have people uh, that, that work on Postgres, but we don't get to define the contract of how Postgres works. Um, we have to live with that. So for these larger components, sometimes what we have to do is actually build a really good fakes. Um, I think it's a real shame that, uh, that the term and the idea that's gotten a lot of mind share and testing for, for test doubles is mocks. Um, mocks are, you know, neat, but you can, uh, you can also make it so you're not really testing anything. There's a lot of other good tools in having fakes and stubs where you just write an alternate implementation of whatever it is you're doing. You record, uh, you know, responses from APIs and replay them. There are challenges involved in doing that correctly, but, but it's still a lot faster than you're ever gonna get dealing with the real thing. And that can help you inch down that time uh, in CI. For things that get complex enough, you may need to write a full simulator. And this may seem like a waste of time to a lot of people, but I'll give you an example of how this worked for us at Ivan. Um, so we offer open search uh, at Ivan as, a, you know, as one of our services, and uh, as we were expanding our offering for this, we ran into a problem where all our acceptance cases, all our acceptance test cases were taking three, four hours to run, and we were trying to run this on every commit. It was extremely expensive and extremely slow. Uh, one of our developers took it upon himself to actually refactor the code base around this uh, to create a version, of, a fake version of OpenSearch that, from the point of view of our control plane, looks very, very similar, almost indistinguishable. Now, it, it's not actually a search database, but it, it, well, it, for the purpose that we need of, you know, you need to look like open search to our control plane, it works fine. This, this three week project, I think, you know, took our, uh, our open search um, test times from three to four hours down to three to four minutes. It's a huge order of magnitude decrease that you can get by doing the, these kind, this kind of work that can pay off in huge ways because this doesn't, that three weeks will, will, mean, will mean hours off every developer touching this for, you know, ad infinitum. Another important thing uh, you, we can do is, is to run the right test. 
if you have a big enough project, some people solve this by I think just they start dividing their projects up, but not everybody gets that luxury or sometimes there's good technical reasons to keep things together. Um, and, but if you have a big enough project, you'll find that traditional CI tools or traditional build tools don't always do the right job for selecting what you want. They tend to just say, give me everything below and I'll, I'll build that. Or you could do things like divide things into folders, but then you have to start figuring out how they connect together. Um, but what you really want when you have a tool like this, you want to have a right size pipeline. Different changes require different, uh, different size numbers of tests. They require different kinds of builds. Uh, and you know, if you change something that's used by everything in your system, perhaps it's a good idea to go ahead and run tons and tons and tons of tests. But if you change one thing that's used by a very small part of it, you just need to run a smaller bit of it. Uh, for doing this, you need things like GraphAware build tools, something that, that, can, that can actually look into your code and see this, this little bit requires this, this bit depends on this, this bit depends on that, and by, by using your, your dependencies that are expressed in your code base, either inferred or, uh, or you know, explicitly stated, you can start running the, you know, the code that, that depends on your changes and uh, select the right test in a more intelligent way. The one we're using at Ivan right now is a tool called Pants, uh, or Pants Build, uh, I have its logo there. Um, it's, uh, there's similar tools out there, um, but uh, they're often called mono repo build tools. Uh, they, they help you make sense of these complicated repositories in a big way. Um, I actually want to give a shout out to, to Benji, who uh, works with Pants. He's here today. If you're interested in that tool specifically, uh, feel free to talk to him afterwards um, or check them out. Uh, it's a great tool. We, we, we're just scratching the surface of what we can do with it at IVE, and, and it's helped us. Um, in some cases, reduce um, build times from hours down to 10 minutes, that kind of thing, uh, you know, similar order of magnitude kind of decreases. We, in addition to CI, CD testing, I think a lot of people think that, okay, I, I've done my CI, I've done my CD, I've done those tests, testing is over. Uh, and this is where we kind of want to bring back some of that, those, those ideas from traditional QA. No, testing is not over. There's still a lot of testing to do that goes after CI, CD. If you're using that kind of, this kind of scenario I described of having a five to 10 to 15 minute pipe, an initial pipeline, you're only gonna be doing quarter one test of the agile testing quadrants. You're gonna be doing tests that, that are focused mainly on technology, that focus mainly on, uh, on how, making sure developers know that things are working right, but you still will have lots of functional te cases that you wanna run. You'll still have performance tests and penetration tests and other things that will have a different feedback loop. So I'm not saying you should stop running these things. I'm saying you should run them later uh, as a cron job. People used to say that Jenkins was not just a, a fancy wrap around a cron job. Use it like that or use whatever tool you use. Um, instead of saying, you know, you can't go to production, you want, when the test fails, you just make a ticket, send it to developers, have them fix it later and have them fix the, the, the fast test that, were, that, were, that didn't catch it earlier. To do this right, too, I think one of the things, maybe, maybe it might be a bit controversial, you need to have some things in place uh, to, uh, to make it effective. Uh, and this is a, a recent lesson that I've, that I've learned, uh, I, I, is to always have uh, the ability to retry tests. Uh, I think this is controversial because uh, people, a lot of people think you shouldn't have flaky tests at all, but when you have big enough test cases, there's gonna be something that's not working about it. Um, and having tests that are retry easily retriable is a lot more important than having tests that are perfect. It's a lot harder to get tests that are perfect and telling people to write perfect tests is like telling them to write code with no bugs. Having tests you can retry easily lets you distinguish flaky from broken, which may sound weird, but that's an important distinction because a flaky test is, is a ticket you can work, you can, at your, you can schedule at your next planning cycle. When are we gonna take care of this flaky test? A broken test needs to be dealt with now. It's a bend, don't break strategy, and uh, I think it, it's actually helped us uh, get past a lot of hurdles within our own development process. To support these kinds of things, you're also gonna need a good reporting infrastructure for getting the, the test information back to your developers. At Ivan, we kind of dog food our own services. Uh, so we, for logging, getting logging back to our um, um, our developers, we just aggregate things in open search logs. We tag them by, uh, um, we tag them by, you know, by the build number. People can look through them uh, for metrics. You know, what happens on different VMs, what happens in different things. Similar, we use a, 
a, a time series database we have called M3. Uh, for our reporting and our history, we use uh, PostgreSQL. Uh, Ivan for PostgreSQL, just general relational database stuff. And for displaying this all for our users in nice formats with links, graphs, that kind of thing, we dump it in dashboards that we created on Ivan for Grafana. For us, this works well. There's a lot of tools out there. You don't have to use us, but there's many, you need to have invest some time and, and, uh, and effort into building good infrastructure for reporting information from these continuous tests, from these, from these uh, tests that run outside of CI back to your developers so they can fix the problems that, that those things find. It's like, for why to use us? Well, because it, it's managed and predictably priced. You, you know what you're going to pay for, you know what you're going to get, you don't have to worry about backups. Uh, uh, these are all open, search, pro, open source uh, products, and, uh, you know, and you could run your own if you wanted to, or you could use alternatives, but uh, for us, I'm just saying that, that we, we, uh, we dog food what we have because it's the easiest thing for us to do. Um, you can check us out if you want. Um, but I know in the past I've used tools like Allure or whatever to, uh, to do, handle reporting and other things. That handles part of this, but not all. Um, any other follow-up to that? Or, okay. um, the last little bit of this is you want to leverage the late stages of your pipeline or the, the CD part of it. Um, this is mostly a CI talk. The CD is not, I haven't talked about it maybe as much as I, I, you know, I would like, um, but the late stages of your pipeline, again, need to be that feedback loop feeding into the earlier bits of it. Uh, and the, some of the better ways to do this are to take use of feature flags, this is probably nothing new, but feature flags are not a complicated thing. They're just little toggles that you can turn off uh, on and on in your code base. They can be from config files. They can be, you can use whole, you know, whole uh, dedicated feature flag systems that are out there. Uh, or, you know, in our case, we just, use a, we just have values in a database that are often our feature flags. What this lets you do is it lets you delay the decision of of when to really deploy something by, by okay, I'm gonna deploy the code around it, but I can turn it on when I'm ready for it. I can turn it on where I'm ready for it. And that's important for the, you know, the last bit is where can I run my tests? You don't just have to run your tests in your CI environment. You can create dedicated staging environments for doing this stuff, that have dedicated accounts. Uh, another interesting thing to do is to you, uh, take advantage of multi-tenancy um, uh, systems if you have that. If you have a really strong tenancy notion in your system of there are built-in barriers that, uh, that this data cannot cross, just make a testing tenant. Run, run your test in production there in that tenant. They won't bother your customers. They won't bother you know, the, the important bits of it. But you can still leverage all, all that ob observability stuff, all the monitoring, all the, you know, all your operations team, you can leverage all of all those resources to help you test uh, without having to, you know, reinvent the wheel for a staging environment. Uh, you can also do traditional canary type deployments where you send it to a, a, um, a small percentage of your customers and get feedback that way. But feature flags give you that flexibility of choosing where do I actually want to run these tests, and it can be in a lot of different places. To kind of put this all together of, of an example of how we do this with a specific scenario at Ivan, uh, I'm going to give you a, a, one that I worked on myself, which was uh, um, a command we called uh, add VM volume or add node volume, I think actually internally uh, we call it. It's just a command that we use to, uh, when you run a lot of databases, sometimes databases in the process of backing up will overwrite their disk. Uh, they, they, something goes weird and they'll just start eating a lot of disk. Uh, an operator in this case needs to rescue uh, that machine by, uh, for us, that, that means adding some more disk and then moving th that database onto a new node with the right size disk. Uh, so we automate a lot of this with a command called add uh, VM volume. The way this works is the ops tooling will submit a work item um, to our work item system. Um, uh, the cloud resource manager, which is managed by a different team, will consume that uh, and then make an API call to the cloud to add some disk, uh, assuming the cloud provide, not all clouds provide that. Uh, in the case of AWS, this would be uh, EBS. It's just gonna extend, uh, add another EBS in, uh, bit to it. And then the, the agent that runs on our nodes will, uh, will vice has been added and then extend the logical volumes that are on the disk. So kind of a multi-part thing. Traditionally, we needed to run this on, like I said, you know, multiple clouds, um, multiple instance types of different sizes with different I.O. configurations. 
Um, and so this was a very expensive test for us to run on every commit or nearly every, at least every master commit that we were, main commit that we were doing. Um, so to divide this up, fortunately, this, this already has kind of some contracts built into it. What's the contract between the, the tooling and the resource manager? It's, it's the, uh, the schema for the work item. What's the contract between the, you know, the other bits? Is, uh, well, the public cloud has, has their own contract on things. And then the, uh, the logical volume bit, uh, you know, it's, its contract is more with Linux. You know, uh, uh, Linux doesn't change that often. So we can get away with just running a simple test on add VM volume. Do you produce the right work item under the right condition? Uh, that, that, that's a simple in-memory test. We can get away with, 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 with mocking out, the, with creating a fake work item passing it to the resource manager and saying, do you create the right API call? And ignoring the, the public cloud call. We can get away with writing a unit test on the logic behind, behind extending a logical volume. And, we, and for most of the time, we can just run those simple tests. Yes, we still run this test, but we run it on a daily basis. We run lots, you know, through lots and lots of clouds. And when we find a problem, we can direct that to the right team. Uh, but this has saved us a huge amount of money just alone, just, just dividing this kind of case up into something much smaller. Uh, and you can do this with a lot of different kinds of tests. Uh, and that's really what we find is working for us for helping us scale. Um, that's, uh, that's what I've got, but uh, if you want to find me, uh, I'm on uh, LinkedIn. I'm also on Twitter, but I don't tweet enough. Um, so I don't know, you can follow me. I, I, keep, I have a resolution to myself that I'm going to start tweeting more. Maybe it'll be interesting. Uh, check us out uh, at ivan.io if you're interested in Ivan, or come talk to me afterwards. I can, we'd love to talk to you more about that. <laughs> yes? Um, for, it's not really my area of expertise, and it's not uh, something I know a whole lot about. Um, I, so I, I don't know if I can answer that. Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, we find the API change, well, I, I, I find it's a lot easier to have API change tests based on a time, because an API doesn't change on your schedule, it changes on somebody else's schedule. Um, so we're, we're tying that, that failure to a commit is misleading. So I find that tying that failure to a time is a lot more meaningful. Uh, so you, that, that's something we do in continuous testing of. We, we regularly test APIs to see if they change, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, I wouldn't say that we have figured that one out. We, we actually have a lot of problems with, 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 with potential state contention in, in sharing databases, because our, our best bet has been we will share databases. Uh, and you know, it, does, it does cause problems. Um, we have an, an, an inherent ability uh, in Ivan, the Ivan platform to fork databases, uh, but it is itself kind of expensive uh, and time consuming, because it's literally creating other VMs and other, potentially other data centers, other cloud regions, other, you know. So I, we don't have a good answer to that one yet. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think I think a lot of our, our stuff is we're, we're there's, there's a lot of argument with 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 internally at, at Ivan about how much business logic we want in the database. Uh, for some being very very for it, and some being very against it. For for a, and the testing thing, it plays into that that uh, that debate quite a bit. So it's not a problem we we really fully solved. Any other questions?
All right, well, thank you. Okay.